In this video, we're gonna start to stack things up and use multiple compressors on the same audio source. There's a few ideas that we need to cover in this video before we start getting into mixing and mastering, but there's also a couple of really neat tricks that we can do to start to coax a little more character out of our audio. So we're going to start by taking a look at serial compression. Serial compression is really just putting a compressor on top of another compressor on top of another compressor. So we're essentially taking one signal and compressing it, and then taking that compressed signal and sending it to the input of another compressor, and recompressing it all over again with completely different settings. Now serial compression kind of already happens naturally during the production process. So we might compress a track and then compress its bus, and then maybe compress our master bus, and then it gets sent off to mastering, which it's recompressed again. And the main thing that serial compression gives us the ability to do is control not only the macro dynamics, but also the microdynamics of an audio signal. But it really depends on how you set it up and what type of source material you're working with. Okay, so back in our session here, I have our snare top mic soloed, and as the last plugin on the snare top mic, we have an oscilloscope plugin inserted, which is going to allow us to see the waveform of our audio signal in real time as we make changes to it with the compressor. So it'll give you a more visual representation of how the compressor affects the envelope of different instruments as they sit in our mix. Now, one of the points that I really want to drive home with serial compression is that compression has an additive effect anytime it's affecting our audio signal. And this occurs at any point in the chain, especially in our mix. So we'll have like track compression and then bus compression and then maybe even master bus compression. And as long as our audio signal is triggering the gain reduction circuit of a compressor, its dynamic range is being reduced. So we're gonna do a semi-scientific test here just to show you kind of what I'm talking about. We're gonna insert a compressor plugin onto our snare drum. I'll just choose this standard compressor here. We'll try a threshold of minus 28 and a ratio of two to one. I'm gonna reset our meters here, both our peak and our RMS meters. I'm actually going to duplicate this same compressor and its settings four times in series. Now, if we play it back, we're gonna take a look at our RMS and peak meters and see what we end up with here. Okay, so we have a peak of around minus 16 and an RMS of around minus 42. So with compressors having this additive effect, we should be able to get relatively the same effect of a compressor that has an eight to one ratio. So we have four compressors with a two to one, which should be around the equivalent of an eight to one. So I'll bypass our other four compressors, and then we'll do another test with just our one compressor that's set to an eight to one ratio. So let's reset our RMS and peak meters, and we'll test it again. Okay, so you can actually see we were pretty close to our previous values of minus 16 for our peak and minus 42 for our RMS. It wasn't completely exact just because of a few of our metering inconsistencies and partly due to the way that serial compression works, but you can see we were very, very close. And if we repeat this test with a compressor at a six to one ratio and a compressor at a two to one ratio, you'll see that we actually get similar results here. And this time you'll see we have minus 16 and minus 41. So this just kind of drives the point home that these ratios of compressors in series are going to be additive during the whole production process. So I wanted to show you the main difference between using a single compressor at an eight to one ratio or multiple compressors set in series is when we use multiple compressors in series, we can really start to manipulate the envelope of the waveform. We can use one compressor to affect the input of another compressor and how that second compressor behaves. These techniques we use more for dynamic shaping. A lot of these aren't really traditional techniques on how you would apply compression out of the box from the get-go, but they can serve a more supporting role in your mix. So to bring out a lot of the stick sound, I'm actually gonna grab one of our VCA compressors. You'll remember from one of our previous videos how VCAs are super fast and they're typically super clean. Now the good thing and the bad thing about VCA compressors are that they're typically, for the most part, capable of very high gain reduction values. So if we really want to bring the stick sound out of a snare drum that doesn't really have a very strong stick sound, we need that high factor of gain reduction. Now as we bring down the threshold on our compressor here, just take a look at our oscilloscope and see what's going on with the waveform.
Okay, so we got a great stick sound, but we can't really hear the rest of the drum. If we bring this back into the mix, we're really only going to hear that instantaneous pop of the stick sound that we're getting. So what we can do is add a secondary compressor. This time, I'm really going to try to pick something that has a very, very fast attack time. So I'll actually grab our 1176 here, and we'll put this in series right after our DVX. The attack and release controls on an 1176 are actually kind of backwards. When we move it clockwise or to a higher value, we actually have a faster attack time. And when we move it to the left or to a lower value, we have a slower attack time. But all of these attack times are actually under one millisecond. So it's a very, very fast compressor. So the numbers on the attack and release knobs don't actually represent any realistic values. So when our attack knob is all the way up, we actually have an attack time less than 20 microseconds. And when it's all the way down, it's around 800 microseconds to around one millisecond. A release time is actually adjustable from around 50 milliseconds all the way to the right to just over one second all the way to the left. So anytime you grab for an 1176, make sure that you understand how these attack and release knobs work and that they're actually backwards and these numbers on the front don't actually represent any real values. Okay, so I'm gonna start with this bypass and just keep an eye on our envelope of the waveform over here. And when we start to engage the 1176, we'll take a look and see how we can reduce the peak values of that waveform and start to bring up the sustain of the snare drum a little bit while still being able to maintain that really cool stick sound that we have. So we'll unbypass. Make sure our attack is fast. We're gonna make our release fast too. Now we'll start driving that transient into the 1176. You can see our envelope in our oscilloscope over there. Bypass. Really bring out that sustain. Okay, so this is quite an exaggerated effect that I kind of wanted to show you to get your wheels turning as to how you can start to manipulate envelopes by using serial compression. So we're kind of using the DBX to control the microdynamics of the snare drum, and then we're using the 1176 to control the macrodynamics or the overall dynamics. And that's just one quick example, but this is more like rainy day kind of stuff that you want to experiment with and see if you can hone in on some really cool workflows using multiple compressors. Okay, so moving on to our next subject, we're going to start talking about parallel compression, also known as New York compression. It's actually a pretty simple and easy trick to get more heavily compressed sounds with a natural transient. So when you spend all of this time on each one of your tracks, carefully crafting every transient, it is possible that you may need to level out the overall signal with another compressor in series. But like you saw in our previous example, sometimes it really destroys those initial transients. So here we have all of our drum tracks being sent to our main drum bus right here. And our main drum bus just has some gentle compression on it just to kind of level things out a little bit and give it some glue. I've gone ahead and inserted our oscilloscope on our master output that our entire mix, including our drum bus is being sent to. So let's take a look at what the transients on our drum bus look like. So the overall sound really isn't that bad, but I do kind of want to add a little bit of glue to it. The issue is that if we reduce our threshold on the drum bus anymore, or even add another compressor in series, we're really going to kill those awesome transients that I spent so long trying to get to pop out of the mix. And that's where parallel compression really excels. And the concept is simple. So we have our original uncompressed track, and then we have an exact copy of that track that's heavily compressed. We can start to blend in the heavily compressed track and keep all of our original transients in place. This will give us a very natural sound while still being able to have that glue that we can only get from a more heavily compressed audio signal. Essentially, you're going to end up with two tracks that have the same source material on it. I've already gone ahead and set up a secondary track and called it Drum Parallel. It's essentially a copy of our drum bus, except it has some extremely heavy compression on it. And here I've gone ahead and selected our TubeTech optical compressor. Let's take a listen to just what's going to be our parallel track. So 
So you could see how I really just tried to take those transients down and we do end up with a very highly compressed signal. It doesn't sound very natural. Well, one of the cool things that you can do is we can start to blend in our original track and have some of those original transients poke through and mix some of that original signal back in, which will make us sound a lot more natural. Okay, so we'll start to bring our original signal back in. You can see and hear how those transients are just kind of overtaking that overly compressed signal. And you can also work backwards. So if you wanna start with your original signal and then start blending in your compressed signal after the fact, you can certainly work that way as well. And it may give you a slightly different effect. So I do encourage you to try both ways if you're going to be using parallel compression. So let's try it out. So we'll bring up our parallel compressed track. It's definitely subtle, but you can certainly hear a little bit more glue. This is definitely more natural sounding. Parallel compression is a great trick. You can use it on bass guitar, acoustic guitar, piano, lots of different things where you want to retain some natural sound when using compression. Now, the other important thing that I'd like to mention just about parallel compression is I prefer to keep parallel compression in the same domain that I'm working on. So if I'm working in the box and keeping it digital, I usually use parallel compression as a plugin. If I'm mixing on a desk or in the analog realm, I'll strictly use analog compressors outside of the box through something like an effects or an aux send. And that's mainly to keep everything phase coherent. Sometimes when you mix the digital realm and the analog realm, and especially when we're dealing with timing and things like that, you can run into phase issues. Now, the one exception where I would send a signal out to a compressor and return it would be in the case where our compressor actually has built-in parallel compression and has a mix knob. That's the case with our Chandler Limited Little Double Compressor, but you'll see it on a lot of different compressors too. We have a mix knob that essentially just mixes the fully compressed signal with the uncompressed signal. But since the parallel compression is happening all within the same domain, we don't really have to worry too much about phasing issues or anything like that. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed this video. In the next video, we'll be getting down and dirty with mixing with compression and learn some of the ideas and concepts behind using dynamic range compression in a mixdown setting.